It's, it's my pleasure to announce uh, Andreas Flachos as, as a first speaker in that session. Andreas is a professor at the University of Freiburg. He uh, so made many contributions to, to our understanding um, of, of TMS and looking forward to what he has um, to, to show us today. Thanks a lot, Alex, uh, for the intro and uh, glad to be part of this and uh, to have the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about our favorite topic, which is uh, synaptic plasticity. Now, I, I usually start those presentations with an image of the human brain, the fixed human brain, in this case from our dissection course, briefly defining what actually plasticity is and particularly emphasizing uh, structural, functional, molecular adaptations at neuronal contact sites. So emphasizing the relevance of a synaptic plasticity in complex brain function. And uh, at times, so this type of intro, particularly um, this image, uh, may cause some, I would call it uh, eye rolling, at least to those who are very well aware of the fact that synaptic plasticity has not yet been demonstrated, at least at the single synapse level for the human cortex. And I should say until recently, because a while ago, we teamed up with uh, Jürgen Beck, um, head of neurosurgery in uh, Freiburg, and we obtained small parts of a larger cortical axis uh, region that is being removed during surgery. We take this little slab, we prepare acute slices, and then we can record actually from living human neurons and assess structure and functional plasticity of these neurons. Now I have to say that we have not yet done TMS on this, this is up and coming, but um, what I can tell you today already is that synaptic plasticity is a thing in the human cortex. And I think that's good to know when we talk about translational animal models and translational, using TMS as a translational tool. So what um, Max did here, he actually used um, retinoic acid, which is a vitamin A derivative that is well established in the field for its plasticity promoting effects. And what he did is he recorded from individual human cortical neurons, so-called amparoceptor mediated excitatory postsynaptic currents. And the amplitude of these events um, is considered to reflect synaptic strength. And as you can see here, there is a strengthening of excitatory neurotransmission that correlates quite well with changes that we see at the level of the individual dendritic spines, so little protrusions that carry the majority of excitatory synapses. So what we saw here is that these functional changes correlate with an increase in the head of these dendritic spines while the number of spines is not changed. So this is uh, first evidence that indeed synaptic plasticity can happen in human cortical slices. Now, while we are still pretty excited that we can record from living human neurons, these findings actually reminded us of what we have been repeatedly showing in the context of repetitive magnetic stimulation. So here in this context, it's not transcranial magnetic stimulation, like our favorite model right now is stimulation of organotypic tissue cultures prepared from the mouse brain. And these tissue cultures contain the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus. And uh, we are interested particularly in C1 pyramidal neurons. The reason being because this brain region is among the best studied brain regions uh, with respect to synaptic plasticity. So we can resort to large body of uh, literature in this context. Also, the connectivity, the anatomy, the lamination of the hippocampus um, is uh, something that we can exploit when it comes to learning more about how repetitive magnetic stimulation induces synaptic plasticity. So, similar to what I've just shown you, and we've shown this many, many times now, it's a very robust phenomenon. 10 Hertz repetitive magnetic stimulation induces synaptic strengthening. This is from an unpublished data set that Christ is now uh, preparing. Um, again, an increase in the amplitude of the excitatory postsynaptic currents. And uh, it's scary, but it's almost a decade ago. This was back then in Frankfurt, a uh, collaboration with Ulf Zimmern when both of us were still in Frankfurt, that we were actually able to demonstrate that the functional changes that we show in our organotypic tissue cultures correlate with structural changes, similarly to, the, to what I've just shown you in the human cortex, increase in dendritic spine heads, okay? The interesting thing here was that this was particularly observed in small spines. And this is something that we're, that I'm not going to talk about today, but we're currently following on. Um, 
Now, what have we learned meanwhile about how repetitive magnetic stimulation induced plasticity, at least in our experimental model? Well, we've carried out a set of pharmacological experiments that um, showed us, for example, that the activation of neurons, so the induction of action potential is relevant for an increase in EPSC amplitudes to occur because when we stimulate our tissue cultures in the presence of tetrodotoxin, which blocks sodium channels, blocks action potential inductions, there is no plasticity. The same is true for inhibition of NMDA receptors and also voltage-gated calcium channels. And this here is just a control experiment to make sure that it's indeed calcium-dependent signaling pathways that mediate this effect. So here's the model, basically, the starting point. So what we believe is happening during stimulation that apparently neurons are being activated, they spike. Glutamate is released from presynaptic boutons, which activates AMPA receptors. And changes in AMPA receptor content are actually reflecting these changes. This is what we call plasticity, the accumulation of more AMPA receptors. So an initial activation of AMPA receptors will, of course, cause depolarization, which removes the magnesium block from NMDA receptors. And now calcium can enter these neurons either through NMDA receptors or through voltage-gated calcium channels. And it's important to mention explicitly that apparently, again, in our experimental model, inhibition of one of these entry sites is sufficient to block synaptic plasticity. So either you block the NMDA receptors or you block the voltage-gated calcium channels. This actually will prevent the induction of uh, synaptic plasticity through repetitive magnetic stimulation. Now, we are uh, currently uh, very interested in uh, better understanding calcium dynamics during stimulation. So what I've shown you so far are artifacts, so the potentiation induced by TMS. And Christa has actually built a cool setup in the lab that, we are, that is up and running these days. So um, we have a carbon-based stage and place a regular figure of eight 70 millimeter in a diameter coil below um, the petri dish that contains the neural tissue. We can combine TMS with optogenetic approaches. We can wash in, wash out drugs, and we can do functional optical imaging with this. And this is just an example of a calcium imaging experiment just to generate some confidence that during magnetic stimulation, there is an accumulation of calcium. And I promised Christo <laughs> not uh, talk uh, about too many details here. We are preparing a story up and running later this year, I think. Uh, it will appear. What I can tell you, however, and this will be important um, since I will come back to that, please note that there is an accumulation of calcium uh, during TMS happening around the somatic compartment, also in proximal dendrites. Okay, so keep that in mind as I'll be um, coming back to that sort of uh, finding. Now, how do we move on from here and how do we translate these findings that are obtained in organotypic tissue cultures? Um, to the intact animal brain and uh, ideally all the way to the intact human brain. Well, there is a set of uh, limitation or challenges that we need to consider in this context. One of them, of course, being how to link the physical input parameters of magnetic stimulation, in this case, to the effects um, at the network cell and molecular level. And more recently, we also started looking a little bit into the effects of glial cells and also vasculature. I think we'll hear more about glial cells in the next presentation. There is an enormous parameter space, gigantic parameter space, not only with respect to the stimulation parameters, apparently. And here we are particularly interested in, currently at least, orientation and strength of electric fields. So the setup that I showed you before, we can now you know, turn around our tissue cultures and evaluate different orientations. The electric field is kept constant, but the tissue culture is moved. Enormous parameter space because we have to consider also the architecture of the target region and, of course, properties and state of neuronal networks that are stimulating. And last but not least, I think it's fair to concede that we're still lacking a profound mechanistic understanding of how TMS affects brain function. And from my perspective, being a synaptic plasticity expert, how plasticity in the end of the day should be modulated under these conditions. Should we improve it? Should we block it? Should we maybe induce an alternative compensatory form of plasticity, which counteracts maladaptive changes and so on and so forth? So it is, a, you know, it's a complex topic, a challenging topic. How to address or how to start tackling um, these uh, complex questions? One, one strategy, and Alex already mentioned this, 
is to use computational approaches, experimentally validated computational approaches uh, to simulate the effects of um, electric stimulation, in this case, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So we teamed up with Alex, uh, Peter, and Gillian a while ago and built a toolbox um, that we call NEMO TMS. And I'm not going to talk too much about NEMO TMS today. Um, just briefly, uh, NEMO TMS is combining simulations um, of electric fields. We're linking those to realistic compartmental models, single sets right now, but we're pushing towards small networks. And we go all the way down to uh, calcium signals. And I hope I'm starting at least to convince you that it might be interesting. It might be promising to look at calcium. And I'll show you some additional examples in, the, in a moment. So what I'd like to do today is, again, not talk about NEMO TMS, but give you sort of a sneak preview of where we are heading with this and how we want to combine computational approaches validated by experiments to learn more about RTMS and um, reestablish or establish it as a translational tool, a powerful translational tool in synaptic plasticity research. So coming back to that finding, uh, which I've shown you already, like the robust strengthening of excitatory synapses, um, this has always struck me. Uh, why? Because being, you know, basic neuroscientist that does classic LTP experiments, 10 hertz stimulation is not something that one would expect to induce LTP. The opposite is actually the case. Frequencies below 20 hertz are usually inducing LTD. So the question really is why and how is 10 hertz RTMS or RMS in this context inducing LTP in our uh, case? And why is it not inducing LTD? As a matter of fact, when we apply the very same protocol with local electric stimulation, and this is shown here, we get LTD, okay? So let me explain you briefly the, this experiments. So in this case, we stick a stimulating electrode to stimulate the Schaffer collateral, so the projection from CA3 pyramidal neurons to CA1. And then we stimulate those axons while recording local LFPs in uh, CA1 region. So these are evoked LFPs, excitatory postsynaptic potentials. And the slope of these events is considered to reflect AMPA receptor content of excitatory synapses. So in a sense, um, these are LFPs, exocellular recordings, but they sort of record the same thing as our single cell recordings, the EPSC recording, EPSC is recording that I showed you so far, okay? So what we can do now is we apply a test stimulus and we record the LFPs. And after obtaining a baseline, we apply the same protocol that we do with the TMS, with this local electrode, 10 Hertz, 900 pulses. And as you can see here, um, the same test stimulus now induces LFPs with a smaller slope and also smaller amplitude, okay? So and this is consistent with LTD. Now, the big question really is, um, in which respect is repetitive magnetic stimulation different or similar from local electric stimulation, particularly considering that there is this idea around the TMS acts predominantly on axons and induces action potential. So how can we use these two approaches? How can we use computational modeling to learn more about how actually TMS induces magnetic stimulation? Again, in our experimental modeling, and then of course, we should be concerned about to translate that all the way to intact human brain. So uh, let me show you how we followed up on this. And this is probably the most complicated slide of my uh, presentation. So please bear with me, I try to explain it. Um, um, if you don't understand everything, don't get stressed. Um, I'll catch up later on and try to simplify things a little bit. So for the plasticity aficionados in the audience, uh, these are now two pathway experiments. So we are still recording LFPs from CA1, but now what we can do is we can stimulate two pathways independently. So we can probe that pathway, record an LFP, and we can probe that uh, pathway and record another LFP. And the nice thing is that in this setting, we can induce plasticity in one pathway while the other pathway will not be potentiated and then later on induce plasticity in the other pathway and vice versa, wash in drugs. So it's a powerful tool to learn more about plasticity and metaplastic effects. So how the state of the network may have changed. So the same stimulus then could produce a different plasticity outcome. Okay, let's go through this step by step. 
So we have the two pathway experiments here. Black is one pathway, the white one is the other pathway. So after obtaining a baseline on two pathways, and this is indicated by the arrow here, we're inducing a classic LTP, which is, you know, one second, 100 hertz, tetanus-induced LTP. Boom, you get an increase in the slope, and this is a long-lasting LTP response. Now, this LTP response does not affect the baseline on the other pathway. And I've already shown you that our 10 hertz stimulation protocol induces LTD. Again, LTD induction is not affecting LTP at the other the pathway. So what are we doing then? After a while, we are actually increasing the test stimulus to achieve slopes, LFP slopes, comparable to baseline. And now we're doing the metaplasticity test. So we apply the exact same protocol that induces LTP in one pathway to the second pathway that has experienced LTD beforehand, okay? If we would have not interfered with that pathway and we would apply the same protocol, we would get the same extent of LTP. And I have to excuse myself, um, this control experiment, so you have to trust me on that. I mean, it's shown down here, so I'll get to that in a moment. So the second pathway here induces the exact same LTP magnitude than uh, in the first pathway. Instead, what we see here is that now the very same pathway induces a much better LTP. And this is consistent, at least that's what we call it in the lab, with LTD, LTP metaplasticity. Okay. It's complicated, isn't it? Okay, so let me try start making sense out of it and also uh, explain to you how we're exploiting this actually to learn more about um, RTMS-induced plasticity. Now, what about an NDA receptors and L-type voltage gated calcium chain? So we probed um, these two calcium entry pathways in these experimental settings. As expected, if you block an NDA receptors, you don't get LTP. So one second, 100 pulses, full-blown LTP here. We just get a small post-tetanic potentiation that returns back to baseline. However, what we learned from this experiment is that the LTD actually depends on an NDA receptors. We don't see the LTD response, okay? So this LTD component that primes the network to improve its ability to express plasticity is an NDA receptor dependent. What about the voltage-gated calcium channels? And this is shown here, and that's the interesting part. While blocking voltage-gated calcium channels does not prevent the LTD response, it seems to be responsible for the metaplastic effect, okay? Now, I've shown you before that blocking voltage-gated calcium channels is also blocking RTMS-induced or RMS-induced plasticity. So they, uh, there's one interesting um, hypothesis that we actually took out of these set of experiments. Um, namely, we predicted that if this is true and if something like this is happening also during repetitive magnetic stimulation, then stimulation in presence of nifedipine, blocking voltage-gated calcium channels, and looking immediately after the stimulation should actually result in LTD. So nifedipine or nimodipine, which is used in patients, and I would li really love to team up with somebody uh, and design corresponding experiments in uh, human, <laughs> human TMS studies. So long story short, the prediction here is that stimulation, 10 hertz RMS, in the presence of nifedipine should transform LTP into LTD. And I wouldn't tell you the story if that's not true. So here we can see that early after stimulation, there is a depression. So we can transform the potentiation into a depression when we stimulate in the presence of uh, nifedipine. Later on, this sort of bounces back. So we believe that this is some form of homeostatic plasticity that this LTD induction is inducing. And we're still struggling to better understand the frequency changes also. Okay, so that was, uh, you know, a tough part, complicated part, but just a second. So uh, don't worry, uh, second part will be much more, um, much more um, intuitive in this respect. Be with me. The question really is, what do we learn from all this now? So coming back to this comparison, transcranial magnetic stimulation, local electric stimulation, or DBS, one major difference apparently is between these two modalities that um, magnetic stimulation induces much larger electric fields, right? And this is um, not a concern in our tissue cultures. This is modeling that Jolt is doing in the lab, Jolt 2 is doing in the lab, 
So when we look at our tissue cultures, focality is not a problem because we are actually stimulating the entire tissue cultures. We generate focality by actually just deciding or choosing the size or the network that we are interested in. As you can see here, the situation is different in the mouse brain and of course also in the human brain. So in an analogy to what I've shown you so far, what we believe is a major difference between DBS or local electric stimulation and electric and uh, repetitive magnetic stimulation is a difference with respect to the induction of anterograde action potentials and back propagating action potentials, okay? So the local field stimulation, local electric stimulation is expected to mainly induce anterograde propagating action potential, at least in relation to the side that we're recording. Of course, this action potential will also travel back, right? But we're recording, we're interested in that target neuron at this point. In contrast, repetitive magnetic stimulation is expected to induce both anterograde action potentials, but also back propagating action potentials in the target region. Okay. And this is reminiscent of spike timing dependent plasticity. So the major take home message for today will be that we believe that a major difference between local electric stimulation and, and uh, repetitive magnetic stimulation or a major mechanism through which magnetic stimulation acts is a form of spike timing dependent plasticity, which I think um, most, if not all of you are aware. So just briefly, and this is actually where we're going now with NEMO TMS, one direction of NEMO TMS, we are developing, validating and implementing plasticity rules. Um, at this point, they're still based, uh, mainly based on voltage changes, and we're trying to link that to calcium. So just briefly, the, the plasticity rule that we're using here, it's based on a rule that has been developed many years ago by Claudio Klopat and Wolfram Gassner. If the postsynaptic neurons fires before the presynaptic neuron within a time window that is determined by a slowly decaying um, um, membrane potential, then we get LTD. If this you know, interval is too big, slowly decaying voltage, um, voltage, we don't get anything. The other way around, if the presynaptic cell fires before the postsynaptic cell, um, we will get LTP, but only if we get this combination here, post, pre, post, to so really have a correlated activity, okay? So that's the basic principle of the rule. And this is where Peter comes um, into play in the NEMO TMS team. So he um, adjusted that, um, sort of used that STDP rule, adjusted it with some BCM metaplasticity rule. Um, I don't have the time to get into details. I have to also admit, I don't understand everything. The cool thing for us is that that model, that rule seems to replicate the, our experimental data quite well. So when we uh, simulate, what I've shown you today is, we can actually see the LTD, LTP difference. So in this, these are simulations which we use the tenor simulation protocol and only activate the presynaptic neuron, okay? So we induce only anterograde propagating action potentials. And tenored stimulation induces LTD. We do the same thing when we concomitantly, simultaneously activate both pre- and postsynaptic compartments, LTD is being transformed into LTP. So that's the first good news. As a matter of fact, this model also replicates our LTD, LTP metaplasticity experiment, and that is shown here. So 100 hertz, one second stimulation, good news, LTP works as well in this model. I've already shown you the LTD in the second pathway. And if we now apply the same stimulus, 100 hertz, high frequency stimulation, to that second pathway that experienced the LTD, we get the LTP, LTD metaplasticity. Okay, so that's a nice way to validate the model at least um, you know, it's nice to see that it replicates um, our experimental data. And here comes the really exciting part, because what we're doing right now with NEMO TMS, we're implementing that plasticity rule now in the compartmental models, and we want to implement that into the multi-scale, the cross-scale modeling approach. So this is, these are now simulations that do not consider the electric field at the moment, and they're not considering the calcium signal at the moment. It's just based on voltage and the voltage-based SCDP rule with BCM metaplasticity. We apply the 10 Hertz protocol, meaning that we are uh, simultaneously activating the postsynaptic neuron and, the, and its axons, the synapses that impinge on it. And one thing that we saw is, which we're really excited about is, is that first of all, of course, we get the LTP, 
And the other thing is that we are getting a potentiation only on synapses on proximal dendrites, okay? Uh, I'll tell you in a moment why this is so exciting. However, what I'd like to emphasize here is when you attend tomorrow the tutorial, the NEMO TMS tutorial, you will see that NEMO TMS already, without the implementation of any plasticity rules, shows or provides like a, you know, like a, predict, a prediction. The prediction of NEMO TMS is that calcium is actually accumulating in the soma and also in the proximal dendrite. So keep that in mind tomorrow in the tutorial and take a closer look at where calcium is actually accumulating. It's accumulating in the soma and, and uh, proximal dendrites as also predicted by this plasticity rule. And here comes the cool part. We've actually shown that without understanding it very well. We've shown that five years ago already in, in our experimental model. We've shown that our 10 hertz stimulation protocol is not potentiating all synapses on a neuron um, the same way. Specifically, it's potentiating synapses on proximal dendrites. And this is one uh, central experiment that proves that. So what you see here is a recording of an individual neuron while we stimulate um, uh, axons that are impinging either on proximal dendrites or on distal dendrites. So again, here we are exploiting the lamination of the hippocampus. We know if you stick an electrode here, the axons, you know, they're parallel. We know we will be stimulating. We were activating AMPA receptors on that proximal region. Then we move the electrode towards more distal regions. We probe again. And I think you're, uh, you know, even though you might not be electrophysiologist, you already understood the amplitude of these EPSCs reflect synaptic strength. And we only see the strengthening on the proximal synapses. Okay. So the model sort of predicts the potentiation of proximal synapses, which is uh, pretty cool. Usually, you know, models are tuned to predict your experimental designs. In this case, we're really getting into some interesting predictions without tuning the model a priori. Just the basic plasticity rule has been implemented. Next up, just to generate some additional confidence and uh, to share enthusiasm, we checked for frequency dependencies and the model actually predicts that 5 hertz stimulation will um, induce a significant um, a potentiation, again, on proximal dendrites, which is quite interesting because it sort of reflects what has been reported now for many, many years already in the in human TMS experiments. It relates to ITBS protocols and experimentally validating NEMO TMS and further developments in NEMO TMS is what we see in our experimental model. Okay, so pulse match protocol, five thirds. This is when we start seeing um, the potentiation. So um, these simulations are sort of generating sort of a confidence that it's indeed spike timing dependent plasticity that at least is sufficient to predict some of our effects. So I'll uh, wrap up at this point, but just showing you another uh, video, and I'm allowed to show that, uh, you know, got permission from my postdoc, uh, just to give you a, a little bit more complete picture of the calcium signal. And also to come back um, to, the, to the point of screening the parameter space. I've shown you already the CA1. This is where we study plasticity. But what we also see, and I hope uh, you can see it on your monitor, we also see presynaptic activation, okay? So if you take a closer look, you will see some neurons also being activated here. Um, the activation in CA3 is much weaker, which makes sense because the electric field orientation is the way it is. So this is the orientation of the electric field. The neurons here in CA3 are orientated sort of nine degree, degrees to that. And I've already mentioned, you know, that we can now move around the, the, the cultures and actually evaluate orientation and electric field strength in this context. And what we're doing here, in addition to, you know, only imaging, uh, we're combining at the setup, we can combine optogenetics and pharmacogenetics with TMS, sort of uh, hyperpolarizing or depolarizing, changing the state of the network, introducing activity, silencing the network and so on and so forth. So I think this is really a powerful tool, not only to validate NEMO TMS and further develop it, but also to really learn something about um, RTMS and use plasticity. So with that, let me briefly wrap up. Um, how does repetitive magnetic stimulation induce synaptic plasticity? And uh, I'm really talking about repetitive magnetic stimulation on purpose, not transcranial magnetic stimulation. We are in the process of translating that into intact brains, rodent brains, anesthetized mice. And um, I think um, you get the point that we are really trying to push this to the human cortex, uh, at least in human cortical slices. And uh, there is a perspective really to translate it through the 
uh, computational approaches that we are now developing together with Alex. Um, I've shown you today that uh, calcium dependent signaling path has played an important role, specifically NMDA receptors and voltage gated calcium channels. Blocking voltage gated calcium channels, so postsynaptic depolarization, can transform RTMS induced LTP into LTD. Um, we feel quite confident that uh, cooperative pre and postsynaptic activation. Um, explains a big part of RTMS induced synaptic plasticity. And I think it's conceivable that when you think about more complex uh, networks, architectures, that not all of the neurons in the target region will experience postsynaptic activation. So what we believe is, in the end of the day, in the human cortex, we might have sort of a mixture of LTP and LTD. And the sum or the net effect, so to say, will determine you know, whether we push the system towards excitation or towards inhibition, like increased cortical excitability or reduced cortical excitability. And uh, I hope I was able to not only advertise NEMO TMS, but in general, give you an understanding or an idea of how computation modeling can actually help us um, to not only learn more about RTMS and how RTMS induces plasticity, but um, together with experimental approaches, establish or reestablish RTMS as a powerful tool for translation of synaptic plasticity research. That's sort of my major take on this. Um, and uh, who knows, maybe on the way, we will also learn something about therapeutic effects of RTMS. So with that, I'd like to thank people um, in my lab involved in this project, the collaborators in Freiburg, especially Jürgen Beck, for the exciting work that we're currently doing with the human cortical slices. I think uh, the NEMO TMS team has been an exciting journey so far, more exciting stuff to come up. And uh, if you're interested in working with us, collaborating, or working with us in Freiburg, please feel free to contact me, hiring at all levels. And thank you for your attention.